Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Can you see the text? <coughs> okay, very good. I can't make it bigger, so. Um, right. Okay. So I will talk about um, the motion of a liquid body, which could be a um, small water drop or something big like a galaxy. But it's, um, a bound, it's a bounded domain. And um, the idea is that it's a without surface tension or gravity for simplicity. So we, from the beginning, time we have some uh, water drop here. And um, each point uh, have the velocity. And um, the water drop is going to move, but also change shape. So um, the boundary condition here is that the uh, boundary moves with velocity vector field at the boundary and that the pressure is zero outside. And this defines a boundary, free boundary problem. Um, so loosely speaking, the velocity tells the uh, boundary where to move, but the boundary is the zero set of the pressure and the pressure determines the acceleration. So as we will see, the regularity, I mean, many people that know about this problem, but regularity of the boundary is, is very important here. That's the most important thing. OK, so we have Euler's compressible equations. We have a density, and uh, this is Euler's equation, and then the continuity equation. Um, and I use the notation here that is sum over repeated indices. Um, OK, so the incompressible case, which people have talked about mostly so far, is when the density is constant. And in the compressible case, you assume that the pressure is some increasing function of the density. And then there are two cases. There is the case of a liquid, which just means that the pressure is, um, well, the pressure is zero at the boundary because it's zero outside, but the density is a positive constant on the boundary. And a gas is the case when the density is um, zero at the boundary. And as I said, the boundary condition is that the velocity uh, vector field is tangential to the boundary and that the pressure is zero on the boundary. And the initial condition is that you give um, the domain and you give the velocity and density. Now, for um, the compressible case, you're going to have lots of compatibility conditions. If you want a solution in HR, you need R compatibility condition. This is because we will see it becomes a wave equation um, with boundary, a zero boundary condition, and, and such a wave equation needs compatibility conditions uh, to be solvable in solvable spaces. Okay. Okay, so this is um, uh, yeah. So this is just a bit of history um, from um, local existence was first known for analytic data, and then the question was if there was instability uh, in a ray light Taylor instability in some of norms, and then you need a um, physical condition to assume that there is no instability because otherwise there is a counterexample of David Abin. But also C.U. Wu showed us that um, in general, in the irrotational, in the incompressible irrotational case, uh, this physical condition is always satisfied. And, um, but in general, you have to assume it. And you assume it at time zero, and you hope that, well, by continuity, it will be true for some small time. So at least you have local existence. But one possibility of it breaking down is that this becomes zero. OK, so there is um, then an um, uh, incompressible case. I did some work. And other people did work also for local existence. And um, for the compressible case of a liquid, I proved local existence. Uh, assuming this physical condition, and then for a gas, uh, I proved them um, a priori bounds, and then also um, uh, cotans molar probe local existence. Now there is a much longer story now, which I, I can't even fit the rest of the talk. M many people have talked about different ways of proving local existence. Now, in particular, in the incompressible irrotational case, it seems like there are as many ways of proving it as there are people working on it now. 
So I can't mention all, and also of course there is a, a case of global existence now that many people in the audience have, have um, worked on. Um, that I apologize for not mentioning, so uh, now. Okay. So this is a little bit about the intuition here. So in the irrotationally incompressible case, then if you take the divergence of the equation, the top equation, you get using that the divergence of the velocity serial, it becomes um, an elliptic equation for the pressure. So Laplace P should be zero and P is zero at the boundary. Now um, by strong maximum principle, the normal derivative of P is negative, so the, um, the physical condition is satisfied. And um, the question was for a water wave problem, if it would be impulse when the wave turns over, and this is what CU told us that it's not. Now, um, just to show you how, why the boundary is important here, why the whole problem is the boundary. If in this case, if it wasn't for the boundary, you could just invert this equation and one derivative of p would be like with the velocity. Or um, two derivative of p would be like one derivative of the velocity. Um, so one derivative of p would be like the velocity, so the right hand side would just be like the velocity. So this just becomes an ordinary differential equation in function spaces, if it wasn't for the boundary. So this shows that the whole problem is um, with the regularity of the boundary. Okay, so you introduce, to try to deal with this, it's easier, at least for me, to introduce Lagrangian coordinates in which the boundary becomes fixed. So you just follow the flow lines um, of the velocity vector field, the at that in t, and it straightens out in these variables t and y. And everything looks nice. <laughs> um, the material derivative that occur in Euler's equations just becomes d dt, partial derivative with respect to t in the Lagrangian coordinates. Uh, however, this uh, what before was a partial derivative with respect to x has more complicated expressions. So you're trying to somehow stay on both sides to try to use um, this simple expression for d dx on this side and simple expression for d dt on this side. Okay, so Euler's equation then becomes just that the material derivative of the velocity is the gradient of the pressure, and this is the continuity equation. And then um, there is a relation between uh, the Jacobian determinant of the change of variable and the density. Uh, they are in Brochure proportional like this, um, apart from the initial condition. Okay. So, for this problem, you can see that you have an energy conservation. Now, uh, Daniel told us that we should look at the energies on the boundary, but I'm doing the opposite. I'm looking at the energies in the interior. And for the compressible case, and also when the curl is non-vanishing, um, it's convenient to look at the energies in the interior. So you can see that there's an exact energy conservation. Q is formed from the pressure is a function of the density, um, so you just take this antiderivative and we form Q. And you use that the domain um, in the y variables becomes fixed. And the change of variable satisfies that the t of rho times the change of variable is zero. Um, th this just follows actually from, okay, when you take the time derivative of determinant, it becomes the trace of um, the derivative, so it becomes just the, the time derivative of the determinant just becomes divergence of the velocity, in a well-known formula, for taking the derivative of the determinant. Okay, so when you take the derivative of energy, it's convenient to change them to the fixed coordinates, and, and you, you get that the time derivative commute in the fixed coordinates. So for the first term here, you use Euler's equation, the TV is equal to minus DIP, and for the second, um, you use that, well, you use this formula for Q, 
and then you use that the, uh, the continuity equation, that the t rho is, um, is equal to divergence of p. Well, you use it in the next step, actually. Here you integrate by parts now. So you have a gradient of, of the pressure, you integrate by parts. On the one hand, it can fall on the velocity, and um, then there's a relation then between the divergence of the velocity and uh, the t of the density, so those cancel. On the other hand, we get the boundary term. And the, the, the boundary condition, that the pressure is here on the boundary, can be understood as a physical condition that the energy could, should be conserved. Because this is a physical energy, right? So in order for your energy to be conserved, you have to have that the pressure is here at the boundary. Okay. So then, in the um, incompressible case uh, of incompressible liquid, um, together with crystallulu, we proved um, energy bounds. And the interesting thing is that when you go up to higher order energies, you have to add a boundary term. Um, and this is theta here is the second fundamental form of the boundary. And you get an energy estimate like that, which gives a local energy bound. So the energy depends on this physical condition, but it also depends on, on some, like, first order, L infinity bounds for the first order derivative of the velocity and of the second fundamental form. Um, and then with Cotan's scholar, we looked at the compressible gas, but then you have to have energies that vanish it, um, are completely in the interior. And you have this row, which is vanishes at the boundary, the density, so, um, the norms, actually, most of them vanish here at the boundary. And we proved a similar energy bound. Um, but I want, what I want to talk about today is some um, energy bound for a compressible liquid with Shen Yun Lu. And so what we prove is that high-order energy bounds um, I had proven existence before using nash mosa but it was sort of not at all explicit what the energy bounds were. Um, it was existing in some big Sobolev space. Um, so they look like this. So you have the velocity, just like before. Those terms were here in the in, in um, compressible case, but you have a new term here. In particular, um, you have a bit higher order, one more time derivative, extra of the density. You have a wave equation for the density in addition that you, you get an estimate for. In the previous case, this was, of course, constant. So you get an energy bound, but moreover, our energy bounds are, are uniform. So um, we prove that the incompressible limit exists. So this is done in the following way. Instead of thinking of the pressure as a function of the density, you could think of the density as a function of a pressure. And then the incompressible lim limit is when this function just converges to a constant function. And then we show that um, the solution to the corresponding problem converges to a solution of uh, the case when divergence is zero. If initial data satisfy the divergence um, um, of the velocity initially is zero, and also there has to be some compatibility conditions satisfied. Um, and then the question is, I mean, what we wanted to do was, of course, prove long time existence for a free boundary for a compressible Euler. And the hope is that now, if we can prove that the incompressible limit exists, it should be close to the um, incompressible case for which we know that we have long time existence. But in three dimension, anyway, there's um, a blow up. Fritz uh, <laughs> Tom Sider is using the methods of Fritz Jung, proved them. Um, uh, blow up for all small day, for most, that's a condition of some integral being positive. So you can't hope to get global existence like in the um, incompressible case. So a, a question, so you, you expect rho and v to have the same regularity, right? Uh, rho and p. Rho and v. Uh, well, uh, d this has more derivative, one more time derivative actually. In space they have the same regularity. So but they have one more time derivative. Yeah, that's what we can prove. So um, now to prove this, it's natural to reformulate the equation. 
So it looks like Euler's um, incompressible equation. And you could do that. And you can absorb this rho in P by introducing H prime of rho to be P prime of rho. So this, um, this is called the enthalpy. So it just looks like Euler's equation now. Uh, in incompressible Euler equation, the only difference is that, well, you have this equation. The T E of H is divergence of B. And this is the T of the coordinate of the velocity. Where E is some, now some given smooth function such that E is positive on the boundary where H is zero and it increases with H. And also um, we have those conditions have to be satisfied. So we now want to pass to limit when E goes to, um, becomes a constant, E prime goes to zero. Um, so we have to have, and our estimate holds under these conditions which allows us to pass to the limit. But it doesn't allow us to deal with the um, case of a gas where E is zero at the boundary to begin with. And it shouldn't really because this norm uh, shouldn't work for that. Uh, you should have interior norm for that. Okay, so you assume a physical condition. Now, um, what you get here, if you take one more, if you take divergence of the first equation and take the time derivative of the second, you get the wave equation for the enthalpy which is similar, so you just see that if you commute with the t, uh, commute divergence here, you get divergence of v, so the t of divergence of v, which is the t squared of e of h, and then there is the commutator coming from this, which is this term. So this is similar then to the wave equation for the pressure, for the incompressible case. Only difference is this term here, that in the limit um, we hope will go to zero. Okay, so the energies for Euler's equation look like this. Um, the main thing is the energy for Euler's equation itself that looks like this. I will soon describe what this is. Um, there is also two other terms. There's the energy for the wave equation down here that you also have to have um, control over. And there's the energy for curl, which has a better equation, so it's easier to control. Now, you may ask, why do I need curl when I have all these things up here? Well, it turns out this, this Q here is something which um, is, a, is, a, is a positive definite quadratic form, but it doesn't contain all components at the boundary. It only contains the tangential components at the boundary. So this, this um, this norm here is the, the metric in all of our all components minus the normal components. So it's just a tangential, it's a projection onto this. Uh, at the boundary, this is projection onto the tangential uh, component of this tensor. Projection of this derivative uh, partial s to the boundary. And this is necessary for the energy estimate to hold, to do this. Um, at least if you do it like this, otherwise the energy estimate wouldn't hold. And that's why you need a, an extra estimate for curl to help you as well. Okay, so the energy we bound, prove, bound we prove is something like this. Time derivative of the energy is bounded by some, uh, some, a function times the energy. So it's linear in the highest order, but depends also on the previous energy. But at least inductively you can get bounds then for uh, all energy, as long as all those quantities are bounded. In particular, the normal derivative has to be positive, has to be bounced for the second fundamental form, and, and first all derivatives of velocity and some derivatives of the enthalpy also. Now, these derivatives you can then get back afterwards uh, because um, um, you have the energy doesn't contain uh, bounds for all norm. Uh, but um, you can then afterwards bound uh, all norms with the energy using elliptic estimates. So then you can, by Sobolev lemma, bound all these quantities as well. So you get local existence.
So again, can you say one word about this W? What is W? Yeah, this, this is the energy for the wave equation. And you prove that separately, and it's actually easier to prove because the, um, this highest order energy, you can, uh, you can see directly that um, you don't have problem with boundary condition because um, when you integrate... So, so H is like rho. H, 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 um, H is like rho, yeah. So instead of having H to be a function of rho, I now think of rho as a function of H. Oh. Because I want to make it look more like um, uh, incompressible Euler's equations. And this energy actually, so you have, you have a wave equation, the t squared e of h minus Laplacian of h equal to some right hand side f. And um, um, well, you can commute with time derivatives, but if you don't commute with time derivative, well, this is essentially e prime h times the t squared h. And you just multiply with the t of h on both sides. And in this order, because, well, the first term in integrating space, right? So the first term just becomes ddt, ddt of the integral e prime h times the t h squared over 2. And the other term you integrate by parts, but here uh, the th is zero at the boundary, so you don't have any problem with boundary conditions, so you get gradient h squared dx. That this is just, um, um, well, equal to integral f dth, and, and then you use Cauchy's parts as usual. So the energy estimate is actually simple to obtain for just time derivatives but then you have to transfer it to space derivatives. And that's why you can get, you, you can get one more time derivative um, for the energy. Okay, let's see. But um, what, and, and the, the estimate for curl is, is almost trivial because we know that um, when you take curl, uh, the, the gradient of the enthalpy in the right disappears. So this is, this is uh, there's no problem bounding this. It's very easy to bound it. Um, so the main problem is this term. And all the terms here comes with exactly the right cancel, constant for it to cancel. Um, if you want, you can think about them, um, actually. Well, so in the incompressible case, this middle term will disappear. So if you like to think of a simplified case, you can look at that case. And also, you don't need time derivatives in the, um, um, uh, in the incompressible case. So you can just put s equal to r here. So if you want to think about the simple case, you can think about that uh, when we go over the proof, which I wanted to do now. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit sketchy. I probably should write up a little bit more. So we had, yeah, so we had this energy, and what I've done here is just let the time derivative fall on each of these terms, right? Neglecting all sorts of lower uh, order terms when they fall on the coefficients in Q and the measure because it can be controlled. So here you have these three terms, and to make it simpler, you can skip the, uh, this line, and you can think of S, uh, K as being zero, if you want. Okay, so now you want to use Euler's equation, but you also want to use that the commutator between the T and partial um, has this form. And th the fact of the matter is that this partial is not, yeah, it's actually, uh, the, the way to think about it is that this is actually dx dy, right? So partial i is the um, ya dxi times dd ya. So it actually contains um, the coordinates. 
And um, so um, it's a main term actually when, when the derivative, the commutator here is a main term. Okay. Let's see. So in the first term, um, here it's actually not the main term, the commutator. This here says that the uh, dt commutes and you use the equation, dt of the velocity is minus the gradient of, a, uh, of h. That's the first term. You replace it by that. And then the next term is the what we use on the boundary. dt, uh, okay, again we think of k0. And here the main term is actually um, the commutator. So the, uh, over here. So it becomes this, right? dt of, when you commute with one of, of, of um, partial derivatives, it becomes dv. And then all the other derivatives, the main term is when all the other derivative falls on the v as well. So the main term in the commutator is this, plus when the dt has commuted. Uh, and then this is for the interior term. So we, we can skip the interior term for now. The first term here, we, have to we want to do something similar to what we did before, namely integrate by parts and use the divergence in zero. So now, when you take the time derivative, this becomes the gradient of h. And then you, um, I skipped a few steps here, but uh, it becomes the gradient of h. And then you integrate by parts, and the gradient of h falls on the velocity instead, just like it did before for the energy. And so here you get divergence of v which um, is uh, the same as um, dt of h. So it corresponds to this term. It cancels this term. Um, that was the same as before. But in addition, you get the boundary term here when you integrate by parts. And so you have, I should write it out. So what you had was the, is the top term we're looking at. So Q of and let's say R of K is here, two of D I V times D T D R V J D X. This term. And what you did was that you um, commute it. And then it becomes Q of the RV, the T. Um, you use this equation here. Um, no, uh, this equation, yes. So this just becomes dr, the T, VJ. But the TVJ was the DJ of the DJ of H. Okay. So that's the first step. And now you integrate by parts over the domain, and you get two terms. One is minus when DJ falls here, or there's a delta IJ also. So that's Q of um, DI, DR, VI the rh dx plus a boundary term these are all interior terms and the boundary term is the normal component of the e so it becomes n i q of partial r v i times partial r h ds. Um, that should be it, yes. Okay. Um, 
Let's see if I have that. Um, yeah, this should be this term. Okay, so this is a boundary term. Now, I have another boundary term up here. And how does that look like? Well, um, I have to replace it with this. So the other boundary term will look like integral of Q of partial R H dt um, partial R H mu rho d s. And here I use the commutator. So I replace it with this one. So it becomes minus um, dr v j times dj h. Okay. So now the idea is that those two terms should cancel each other. Model that I may not have gotten the signs right. So this term should cancel with this term. And the reason for this is that uh, this dj h is normal at the boundary because h vanishes at the boundary so this is the in goes in the normal direction times the normal derivative of h. So this is the normal component of this tensor, which is the same tensor I have here, the normal component. So this was important that those cancel each other. And that's how the energy was constructed, in fact, so that they would cancel each other. Um, there's one more thing that is important. And that's why we have this Q here. Um, there is a low term which is low order, but it requires some work. There's an additional term at the boundary, which looks like Q of uh, partial R H times partial R dT H. Um, dx, ds. Now, we do have, I said before that we have um, additional interior estimate for the th, but we would have problem estimating this actually, the norm of this at the boundary. So this is where this projection comes in. Um, and this is what I will end talking about now. Um, so the point is that this Q makes it so that at the boundary it's nothing but the norm of, of the tangential component or projection of this tensor to the boundary. Now, how do you project, uh, what does that mean? Well, um, so I should write that up too. So what is the projection of a tensor to the boundary? Um, well, so this should be delta i j. I mean, maybe I better get. Yeah, it's that you take away the normal component. So um, a tangential derivative, for instance, applied to um, Q, what does that mean? It means that you take um, pi i j, nabla j, applied to Q. So it differentiates in the, it's a projection of this derivative 
to um, uh, the boundary, right? And then you know that then there is a formula. You want to calculate nabla i, nabla y <coughs> applied to q, and then project i i prime pi i uh, y y prime. And um, what you want to do is you want to sneak this projection in here. If you can sneak the projection in here, it becomes just the tangential derivatives. But you make a mistake, which is exactly um, nabla i um, nabla i pi um, y uh, y y prime pi to nabla. Yeah, right to Q. And the mistake you make is exactly this when the derivative falls on the normal. And this is the second fundamental form. So this messy calculation, what it becomes is this. If you have a second derivative and you project both indices, you um, it's the same as first projecting plus something involving the second fundamental form and the normal derivative. So uh, when you look at this term here, it looks bad, but it's actually because the th is here at the boundary, um, it's actually just like r order r minus 1 in, in uh, the th at the boundary. So you have, um, and more of, so that's one thing. Moreover, in the energy, so that's for the estimating the error terms. But moreover, in the energy, you had this term in the original energy. And this is now equal to, well, to the highest order, it's equal to this. This is the highest order term, actually. These are low order, because the boundary is the most important thing. So that's actually equal to now to the norm of the tangential derivatives, r minus 2, of the second fundamental form squared at the boundary. So the energy gives us estimate for the second fundamental form in this way. And that allows us then to control the error terms. Um, th they're not dangerous, right? Because they're, they're going to have exactly the same um, second fundamental form in front of it. So um, yeah, so basically th this is the, the technique. The problem was that. Um, uh, it doesn't work to prove existence in this norm, but um, so you have to do it in there. Uh, because you're basically using Eulerian coordinates. These this derivatives here are DS is the Eulerian derivatives. And you sort of have to fix yourself in the Lagrangian frame to prove existence. But the energy estimates works out nicely this way in all, um, in all cases. Actually. Why do you construct your energy in this way, like you, you involving Q? Uh, why? Um, why? Why? Did you yeah, why did we know? So this started with um, Dimitri and I did it, yes. Um, where did it come from? Well, <laughs> it, it came, yes, from the knowledge of this formula here. Right? Because it came actually from that you wanted this pressure term to cancel, right? This term, you had to get it to cancel because this was higher order. And there was no way of doing it if we couldn't somehow get this to cancel. And it sort of came from the knowledge of this formula um, and the understanding, I guess, that the regularity of the boundary is the important thing. So nothing like you cannot replace Q by something else? Uh, no, uh, I, can't, I can't do that. Um, um, when I 
Yeah, I am. Um, and it doesn't, I don't know any interpretation. You know, the, the lowest order has, a, the first two terms has an interpretation. These terms come from the energy, right? Just a generalization of the energy, the first two terms. Uh, the physical energy. Because if, if R is zero, it reduces to exactly the physical energy, the first two terms. And you just plug in the derivatives. And then you take the derivative and you see that in order for it to cancel, you have to add uh, this boundary term. Because it, now, when you, before when you integrated by part, um, this term didn't happen because some other pressure was zero at the boundary. But now, because you have derivatives here, it's no longer zero. So you s realize you have to add a boundary term. I guess that's the way, the way it works. So it's more or less like a guess. Yeah, it's a guess. So you first figure out the first two, and then you, yeah. you realize you have to have the third term. Well, again, and then the next step is to add in this Q because you realize that the this term has to cancel, yeah. But it would have been nice if there was a physical interpretation. I, I think maybe, maybe Chateau, some other people, some students of David Rabin tried to interpret it as curvature on, you know, this Arnold space of um, geodesics where you, f where you think of um, Euler's equation as, as a... Uh, action of, of some minimizing some um, action. And I think they could interpret this, this um, the term maybe as some sort of curvature in that s this infinite dimensional space. I think there might be some sort of interpretation like that. Does this have anything to do with the energy you and those in the uh, Dimitri? Yeah, this is Dimitri one, the one with Dimitri, but without the middle term, yeah. Okay, so the difference between this and the, the one with Dimitri is you add the actual middle term. So add a middle term and also time derivatives, oh. uh, because we only have space. And also you have to add, um, you know, the equation for them. The have to add the double, okay. You had to add, um, well, it was previous, but you had to add them. Um, a uh, wave equation also. Yeah. Estimate for the wave equation, and you have to um, add the time derivative up to highest order actually, mm -hmm. for this to work. And you have to add, a, in the compressible case, a middle term also. It wasn't too easy actually to get it to work. You actually have to have um, to get everything to work together. It was it was quite delicate actually. It was some, but I guess was that you realized we realized we can have one order more of time. Uh, um, of the enthalpy, you can uh, allow yourself one more time to revert. That's what made it work. Um, but it was much more complicated. And also, these estimates are uniform now, and um, um, so you can pass to the incompressible limit, which should be interesting to study what happens <laughs> with long time existence in the compressible case, slightly compressible. So yeah, yeah. so, so, yeah, so uh, you maybe you mentioned something about what I mean. So what happens when you look at uh, the gas rather than the fluid? Um, when you look at the gas, so then you can't have a then, then you have a completely in interior uh, um, energies. The energies we had, one can probably do a little bit better with these ones. So there's no boundary term in that case, and, and you have instead you have these functions with um, that grows like vanishes at the boundary. So there are certain powers of the distance to the boundary essentially, and these are the norms um, you have to use in that case. Um. Oh yeah, so so you are saying that you you also have a paper with gas, right? So yeah. the energy is the same. Um, well, um, I not. Yeah, so then you don't have a boundary term, first of all. Uh -huh. Because it, all these energies has to... Well, the energy we used... I suspect you can do a little bit more similar to the energies I used today, but the energy we used was this. It's the same in the sense that it involved a lot of time derivative. Somehow it's convenient to take time derivative up to highest order when you study this, uh, um, the compressible case. That's one thing that they have in common. And, and you, you certainly need those in theory integrals, not just... Um, Boundary integrals. Yep. So, so uh, 
I'm more about the compressible and compressible limit. So what, what can you say about, about that? Well, so, so what we say is that we first we formulate it as um, um, that we think of a density being a function of the enthalpy or the pressure. And um, the density is, I guess, rho zero at the boundary. Okay, so here's your domain. So it's rho zero here, and then I guess pos positive in increasing in the interior. And the incompressible limit would be something like rho zero, I guess, plus rho over k or something like that. Something uh, so that this converges to just rho zero. So k, k is like... K goes to infinity here, right? So k is like 1 over the max number. Um, okay, I don't, okay, okay. <laughs> if that's what it's called, yeah. I, so, um, right, so then what you can show is that you have to, for the compressible case, you have to have initial data compatible with that the limit exists, right? So you have to have the divergence of your initial data. This here has to be zero, for instance. Um, so that has to happen, and you also have to have, prepare your initial data properly, and, and then you can show that, um, um, yeah, the limit of the incompressible solution the limit of the compressible solution b becomes a solution to the compre incompressible equation. So, for your estimate, you need you need like the condition of the pressure at some point, right? Uh, yes. Um. The normal derivative of the pressure. Yes. Um, so, but that that will survive, right? That that condition is this one. I'm not sure that survives because this will require a time of existence that depends on k. Um, well, we, we have a we have a uniform time of existence independent of k, and uh, thi you know this is just by continuity. This is true time zero, and this will be true for some small term time, assuming that the norms don't behave badly, right? As long as they are bounded. You get this at time t, right, is equal to this at time zero. Yeah, but you mean Plus, you need a bound for the time derivative, right? A local bound for the time derivative. But this we have. We have, I mean, we have uniform bound for all sorts of things. Paper will come out soon, okay. so you can check. <laughs> Once again.